Well, good evening and a very, very warm welcome to the historic Playfair Library for the Tam DL Prize. I'm Jonathan Seckel. I'm the Senior Vice Principal at the University of Edinburgh. And when I don't do that, I'm a professor of medicine and a humble hormone doctor. I'm utterly delighted that we are able to celebrate this evening the outstanding achievements in public engagement of two of my esteemed colleagues. This is our first in-person Edinburgh Science Festival event since 2019, which seems eons ago. I'm delighted to see you all here. It's just fantastic that we can get together, albeit masked, but face to face to do public things. Over the next couple of weeks, the National Museum of Scotland will host my colleagues who will be delivering a host of other in-person workshops and activities, particularly for young people. So please attend if you can. But back to tonight. Sharing our science beyond academia and listening to ideas and challenges from the public is crucial. The Tam DL Prize recognises University of Edinburgh colleagues who excel in science communication. We are most grateful indeed to Tam's family for their continuing support of this event. I welcome his son Gordon, daughter-in-law Pamela, and daughter Moira, who are here to join us this evening. Thank you so much for coming. The Tam DL Prize is awarded in the spirit of the man himself. He was rector of this university from 2003 to 2006, and of course famously MP for West Lothian and then Linlithgow for 41 years, and finishing his career as the father of the House of Commons. But today we're looking at a non-political aspect of Tambi DL, his fascination with science and its communication. Perhaps the best evidence for this was 36 years he spent writing a weekly column for the new scientist. Indeed, when he retired, his colleagues remarked, and I quote, the best columnists do not merely present opinions, they provoke, educate, pursue the truth, and challenge authority and orthodoxy. By those standards, Tam Diel has done an exemplary job. I think that really sums up his approach. Anyway, this evening I have the honour of presenting the 2021 Tam Diel Award, and it's to be given to Professor Philippa Saunders and Professor Andrew Horne. Both have made enormous contributions, not just by highlighting the difficulties experienced in those who suffer from endometriosis, but crucially, to listening to people, hearing what matters most to them, and using that knowledge to focus their research to make a real difference to the lives of millions who suffer from endometriosis. Philippa Saunders has influenced the development of engagement activities in our research community for many years. By encouraging her lab members and indeed the whole College of Medicine and Veterinary Medicine community to explore new formats of engagement and the ideas that she has come up with and contributed have built an environment in Edinburgh where we are sharing ever more of our science with the community, even if that research is difficult, sensitive or complicated. We recognise her for her leadership today. As a clinician, as well as a researcher, Andrew Horne witnesses the reality of his patients' lives, but his work to support them doesn't end when he leaves, they leave his clinic. The time, effort, and dedication he puts into sharing information about endometriosis and its research, and in finding ways to communicate the science in an accessible, entertaining and informative way 
sets him apart. What is central to the way both Philippa and Andrew work is that their research is focused on priorities gathered from people with lived experience of endometriosis, and this is crucial. So now I'm going to invite Philippa and Andrew to the stage to tell you more about their work. You'll have plenty of time after that to ask questions once they've spoken. Our head of communications, Hazel Lambert, will join them on the stage as facilitator. And in the spirit of the evening, all and any questions about their research are most welcome. I thank you for coming and let's look forward to a splendid evening. Thank you. Th thank you very much, Jonathan, for that very kind introduction. Uh, Philip and I are delighted to be here this evening and it's a huge honour to have been uh, given this prize. Um, as you are, are aware, the topic of our, our lecture this evening is endometriosis and I'm going to start the lecture and I'll shortly hand over to Philippa. Endometriosis uh, affects a staggering 190 million people in the world today, so it's an incredibly common condition. So this means that uh, someone somewhere you know is probably affected by endometriosis. Could be your friend, your partner, your colleague, your sister, your boss, your mother, your daughter. You could be affected by the condition. But despite endometriosis being so common, statistics in the UK at the moment show that only about 50% of the population have even heard of it. So what is endometriosis? Well, endometriosis is primarily uh, uh, defined by the fact that people with the condition have very severe period pain. But people with endometriosis have pain often before their periods, after their periods, at any time uh, within the monthly cycle. And they can also have pain at other times. They can have pain when they pass urine, when they open their bowels, pain with sex. They can have other symptoms, heavy periods. They can have constipation, diarrhea. They can have difficulty getting pregnant. And like other pain conditions, they also can suffer from fatigue and depression. But if you Google the term endometriosis, you'll come up with this word lesion. And endometriosis is defined also by the symptoms and by the lesion. So what is a lesion? Well, a lesion is tissue like the lining of the womb found outside of the womb. And lesions can be found almost anywhere within the body. Around 90% are found within the, the, the pelvis and 10% at other places, sometimes even within the chest, even within the nostril, even within the tummy button. I'm going to focus on pelvic endometriosis, the, the commonest type, and I want you to look at this cartoon here. If you imagine that this is a section, if you've been divided through the pelvis, the, the female pelvis, and you can see the pubic bone here, the bladder and the womb, and then at the back, the rectum, and then the backbone. Um, and the commonest uh, subtype of endometriosis is what we call peritoneal disease, and this is shown in this image up here, and this is when you get lesions on the peritoneal wall. The, 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 per, the per, peritoneum is the, is the film that's lining the pelvic cavity. And peritoneal lesions, you probably can't even see them here. They're very discreet. They often look like blisters. And this is a picture I took at, at one of my surgeries. And they're, they're almost blue-black in appearance. The other type of endometriosis that we see is deep disease. And this type of disease forms, the lesions form these nodules. And these nodules often involve other structures within the pelvis. They often cause scarring and adhesions. And here, this picture here shows the, the womb, the uterus, the rectum at the back. And this blue-black uh, structure here is a lesion pull, pulling everything together. And then the third subtype we see are called uh, endometrioma. And this is a cystic form of endometriosis that you see on the ovaries. And these endometrioma, you can see, have this black appearance, and they're sometimes called chocolate cysts because of the, the, the color of the altered blood that you find within them. How is endometriosis uh, diagnosed? Well, endometriosis is actually quite difficult to diagnose. As you can imagine, if you have cystic endometriosis, 
that's fairly straightforward to see on, on imaging. And this is a scan picture of an endometrioma on the left ovary, and it has this characteristic, what we call, ground glass appearance. <coughs> Deep endometriosis, again, can show up on, on, on imaging fairly straightforwardly. Um, here, the uh, deep endometrioma, endometriosis is just between the uh, uterus and the rectum at the back. And you can see on the MRI scan where it is. And it almost looks like all the structures have been pulled apart because the anatomy becomes quite distorted with uh, the deep disease. But the commonest type of endometriosis, the superficial type, as you can imagine, is, is very difficult to see. You can't see it on imaging. And the problem that we have is that to diagnose that type of endometriosis, uh, you have to have surgery. You have to have a general anaesthetic um, and have undergo surgery, which is usually keyhole or laparoscopic surgery. So the fact that this is difficult to diagnose has contributed to the fact that currently in the UK, there's this awful seven to nine year delay on average between when a patient presents with symptoms of the condition and actually has a diagnosis and a proper management plan. And this has been compounded by the fact that people have not been aware of the condition, clinicians haven't been aware of the condition, and the fact that the symptoms that I talked to you about can cross over with other conditions and be confused uh, with them. How do we manage endometriosis? Well, I put this picture up here because it requires a, a, a diverse team, a multidisciplinary team, so not just a single clinician, not just a single gynaecologist. But if we look at what we have available to manage um, endometriosis, it can be broadly broken down into surgery to either remove or destroy the lesions that we see. And this is often laparoscopic uh, surgery or hormone treatments, because we know that endometriosis is a hormone dependent condition. And hormones can be given either by tablet, they can be given by injection, they can be given by implants, they can even be given by uh, the coil, which is shown up here. But the problem with surgery, for example, is not everyone gets better with surgery, and we don't have a good way of predicting who's going to get better. And even if patients do get better with surgery, sadly, uh, they often have a recurrence of their symptoms. We have this statistic of a 50% recurrence after five years after surgery. And we don't know if this is because new disease has developed or disease has been missed at the time of surgery. But more likely it's because we just don't have a good understanding of why endometriosis causes pain and surgery probably ignores the role of nerves and immune cells, which we know are important proponents of, of the pain. Similarly, we have a problem with the hormone treatments that we have available. Again, it's very difficult to know which one is going to work for which patient. Um, and often patients feel like they're being tried on lots of different things before we find uh, something to help them. And whilst in clinical trials, all treatments seem to be equal, there doesn't seem to be one that's better than the other, um, we know that the treatment only helps patients when they take it. So as soon as they stop it, the symptoms come back. And that all of these treatments have side effects and they're all contraceptive. And not everybody wants to be on a treatment that, that stops them from getting pregnant. So we need uh, better ways of diagnosing endometriosis. We need better treatments, better ways of managing the condition. And we need to better understand endometriosis. But the problem is there are lots and lots of unanswered questions about the condition. So back in uh, 2016, a group of us nationally got together and formed something called a Research Priority Setting Partnership for Endometriosis. And research priority par setting partnerships have been around for some time and they've been uh, formed uh, for conditions like epilepsy and asthma. And what they do is they bring together patients and clinicians on an equal footing to try and identify questions which haven't been answered uh, by existing research, which are important to both groups, both the patients and the clinicians and not just the researchers. And the idea is that a priority setting partnership ultimately produces a top 10 of jointly agreed research questions and that these are then uh, publicised widely and used to increase uh, funding for the condition. This rather complicated looking slide shows the process that we went through to generate the top 10 research questions 
for endometriosis. And you can see what we did was we started with a, a national survey. We had a good number of respondents and we generated a huge number of research questions. We then the hard, had to do quite a lot of hard work to hone these down into themed research questions, which we then put out to survey again to online ranking um, and generated 30 research priorities, which we then took to a one day uh, workshop, which was carried out in London, where again we brought together clinicians and patients to try and work out together which should be the top 10 priorities. It was interesting uh, for Philip and I to watch this whole process, particularly the, the workshop at the end, because what we noticed was that patients wanted the, the big questions answered, can there be a cure developed for endometriosis, whereas clinicians wanted very particular uh, questions answered. So it was good to see them working together and to work out which uh, we should prioritise. This is at the end of the day, you can see everybody still smiling and, uh, and getting on with each other, holding up the, the top 10 priorities. Um, and these were publicised uh, very widely. They've been used to uh, get uh, research calls, three, three independent research calls for uh, trials across the UK, two of which are being run at the moment. And interestingly, were also used to formulate the uh, national strategy for endometriosis in Australia. So, we're, we're very proud of this initiative. We also use the research priority setting uh, questions in our research. And this figure here shows the sort of pathway that we follow uh, for our research um, in Edinburgh at the Expect Centre. So we identify a question from this list. Um, and then we have a biobank called EduMed, which is a biobank of samples and information that we've collected from our patients with their consent which we then use to interrogate in, in the laboratory. And we have a number of uh, projects that are ongoing. We have two examples here, EndoGut, which is looking at the role of the gut-brain axis in endometriosis and trying to understand the role of diet in the condition. EndoTech, which is using uh, wearable tech smartwatches to try and understand the, the impact of uh, the condition on patients, for example, their exercise, their uh, sleep pattern. We've also developed uh, laboratory models. We've developed uh, mice models of, of endometriosis. And we also run a number of uh, trials, some single centre trials and some multi-centre trials involving patients and clinicians across the UK. I'm now going to hand over to Philippa, who's going to talk through uh, three examples of studies that we're running at the moment in Edinburgh. Thank you, Andrew, and a great pleasure to be here and a great honour to receive this award. So Andrew has told you a bit about this very challenging condition and what I want to do now is share with you some of the things we're doing at the moment. This is just a snapshot of three of our particular projects. Obviously, there's a lot of other things we're doing. But I think these are ones that all sum up some of the work that you might find most interesting. So the three projects I'm going to talk about are EndoGut, EndoTech and EPIC. So the first of these is EndoGut. And this is a project that we're doing in partnership with the Endo Warriors West Lothian, who are a local support group who have more than 650 people who've been really wonderful to work with and also done quite a lot of fundraising for us. Now this project is to look at the impact of diet on endometriosis associated pain. And I think it's really timely to be talking about this because one of the origins of this project was at a previous science festival. Andrew and I were giving a presentation at the science festival talking about our research and we had uh, Sandra, a patient based in Stirling, talking about her life experience with the condition. And one of the things she highlighted to us that she had been able to work out what triggers there were for her pain by looking at her diet, modifying it and working with it. But what was really interesting was in the subsequent discussion with the um, people in the audience, it was really clear that everybody had their own idea about what worked for them. And actually, when we went looking into the literature, we found there were really no very good studies looking at what triggers there were for endometriosis pain based on diet. Although we know from talking to the patients that many of them do eliminate things from their diet as a pain management strategy. And that was the origin of this project. 
So this project's being undertaken by a very talented PhD student, Francesca Herniates. Now, Francesca is enrolled on one of our flagship College of Medicine programmes, which includes formal training in public engagement. We're doing the project with Siobhan Mahoney in Ireland and David McIntyre in Imperial in London. And that's because Andrew and I are not experts in the diet and pain world. Siobhan has years of experience looking at surveying patients, asking them about their diet and how they manage their pain. But she'd never worked on endometriosis before. So that's been really exciting for us and for her. David, on the other hand, is a reproductive expert, but he's been looking at metabolites and he has access to some really wonderful um, assays. So we formed a team to do this project. So this project is based on the really rapidly emerging field, which is now beginning to highlight how the microbiome in our gut, which we all have something slightly different, might influence our pain perception. We're all familiar with the idea that what you eat might influence pain from all those years of migraine sufferers saying, oh, it's chocolate or it's cheese or what, red wine. But we've never really understood the mechanism until recently. But there's now some really interesting studies. There was one done just last year in America where they asked individuals to eat more fermented foods and they found that really helped their inflammatory pain. So the idea here is the bugs in your gut will make metabolites. They'll get out of your gut and into your circulation. They'll have an impact on your immune cells. They may have an impact on your nerves. And if they have an impact on your nerves, they can also affect your brain perception of pain. And there's really good data now showing that there's an impact on visceral pain, maybe on inflammatory pain, neuropathic pain, of course, I've mentioned headache. But the big question for us was, where does this fit in terms of how you might modify your diet, how stress might impact on it, how your lifestyle might impact on it, and ultimately how this might affect endo pain. So this is a big area to get into. So we've broken it down into a few phases in collaboration with the patient group. And what we're looking for here is actual proper evidence, because at the end of it, we want to be able to give recommendations on which is based on evidence, not just on everybody doing slightly different things. So the first phase of this, in collaboration with the endo warriors, is to get information of lived experience by consulting with patients, not just here locally in Scotland, but around the whole of the UK. And for this, we have designed um, an online survey. The online survey, um, Francesca designed it, Andrew and I messed with it a little bit, then Siobhan had a look at it and put her expertise into it. And we're about to launch this survey quite soon. In parallel with this, we've also recruited a cohort of patients, and from these patients, we're going to get feces, urine, saliva, and blood, and collaboration with Siobhan and David, we're going to measure the gut microbiome populations. We're going to look at stress hormones, because we know stress might affect this, and we're going to look at these metabolites. We're going to get a huge amount of data out of this, and we're going to crunch it to the nth degree, and at the end, we're going to give you an answer. I am ever an optimist. We will just watch this space. There'll be an, some really good data in a couple of years' time. So the second project is Endotech. And this is um, using technology to better give us information that might help patients manage their pain experience, might help them predict when they have pain flares. So for this project, which is being undertaken by Catherine, another PhD student, in collaboration with Tanasis, who's a data scientist based in our Usher Institute and partially funded by Standard Life. We're using these smart watches. There's a picture of one of them up here. The irony of it is that they don't actually tell the time, but they're wonderful because they give us lots of data. They're much better than the kind of watch I've got here, which is telling me how many steps I haven't done today. But what they're going to tell us is just how much motion there is from the patients they measure light and dark, etc. So let's have a look at the kind of data we can get from this. This is just one screenshot from data that Catherine was sharing with us last week. And you can see there's a several things here. The, the watch 
has a battery that lasts for weeks on end. So we're not taking a small snapshot here. We're able to look over several weeks at how the individual is, is living, basically. So um, we've got days of the week across the top, and um, it's a really, unfortunately, a bit washed out. But where you see the really dark, um, active bits, those are the daytimes, and then the less active sort of bits in between are the night times. Just eyeballing this, it appears that the individual concerned here has quite a regular pattern of activity, and they don't seem to be um, super active all night, so they are getting some sleep. We, um, because Catherine's a, a, a maths expert and because Thanasis is a data scientist, we can go much further than just looking at this and saying what's going on. We can do really high-level analytics on it. So this, again, is just a plot that we were discussing a couple of weeks ago. And what we're looking at here is taking um, data, but then also matching it up with patient-reported activities. So we're getting data from the watches, but then the patients are telling us on a daily basis whether they feel fatigued, whether they've got pain, what their worst pain is, and other things we're interested in. And then what we're able to do is to integrate these two types of data with each other. And Catherine and Tanasis are able to run um, a lot of analytics on these kinds of data to give us some patterns. We've already recruited um, 15 individuals onto this project, and the data is already looking very variable, actually, in terms of how different people's um, activity is working out. So the one I'm showing here is an individual who's sleeping between um, four and eight hours a night, fairly even. They don't seem to have had too many sleepless nights. At the bottom of the graph is an average pain score, which again um, is, is varying on these different days. But if we look here, we see there's a period, maybe towards the end of this particular period, where their pain was worse. And this may fit with this individual having their period during this time. And we'll be able to know that because they'll tell us um, what was going on. So the final project I'm just going to tell you about is EPIC. And this is a more advanced project that we've been running for many years now. It started with a very talented PhD student, Vicky Young, who did a project with Andrew a few years ago and has involved several postdoctoral scientists and is now um, being led at a level of a clinical trial by Lucy Whitaker, one of our clinical lecturers. So this project is looking at targeting metabolic dysfunction as a non-hormonal therapy for endometriosis. Now, Andrew's told you about some of the effects of the hormonal therapies, and we're always looking for new ways of approaching endometriosis that doesn't involve a hormonal regulation. I'm going to tell you about the project right from when it, it started with, as so many of our projects do, our tissue collection. So it started with the samples from the patients. These are patients attending the clinics that Andrew runs. And from these individuals who generously give us their tissue at the time of surgery, we're able to collect a number of uh, different things. So again, this is that sort of cross-section um, through the body. So we can get those lesions that you've already heard about. We can get cells that line the peritoneal cavity that are really crucial in stopping our organs sticking together. We can get the fluid from inside the cavity, and importantly, we can get immune cells as well and study their function. And the whole ethos here is that by analysing the patient's samples and fluids, we identify changes that happen specifically in the patients, and then that informs the, the research that we then go on to do. So the analysis that Vicky started revealed some really striking changes that we had not anticipated. Firstly, when we looked at this peritoneal fluid in detail, we found that the fluid from the women with the endometriosis had really high levels of this particular factor called TGF-beta. The second factor that we found in the peritoneal fluid was lactate. And then we found that the lactate that we were finding in the peritoneal fluid appeared to be made by the mesothelial cells and they were being stimulated with a TGF-beta. So we've got this nasty sort of feed-forward mechanism there. So why were we interested in lactate? We were really interested in lactate because it's known to promote cell proliferation, that's more and more cells being produced, and also cell invasion where they might invade the body wall. And we know both of these processes are important in forming lesions. 
So at this point, we looked at this data and we thought, what are we going to do? And what we wanted it was a drug that might target that lactate production. Because our idea was if we could dial down the lactate, we might be able to stop these effects and therefore form less lesions. Now, developing new drugs, as any drug developer will tell you, takes years and years and years. So what we do is we look at what's already been made and tested. And this is called drug repurposing. This is a way of short-circuiting that very long making a new drug process. So we went to the drug repurposing library and we looked for something that we thought would be ideal for our particular purpose. And I wouldn't be telling you this if we hadn't been successful in finding something that did seem to fit the bill. And the thing that we found in the drug repurposing um, back drawer was something called dichloroacetate. So dichloroacetate was interesting because it targeted one of the enzymes that we knew was in the mesothelial cells and responsible for making the lactate. It's been around for a long time and it's been used to, to treat children and it's very safe. Sometimes when it's been used at very high doses, it's had some slight minor reversible side effects, but we were never going to use it at those high doses. So this was our take home, let's test it drug. So we went back to the lab and we prepared the first of the assays to test the dichloroacetate. And for this, we used the cells I've been telling you about, and we produced something called a lesion in a dish. So let me explain our lesion in a dish. So what we've got on the bottom of this dish are those mesothelial cells which we've taken from the patients which were lining their peritoneal cavities. And this is the equivalent of that peritoneal wall. In a, in a um, small chamber above that, we, on a semi-permeable membrane, we put the stromal cells that we've taken, which would be the equivalent of the lesion. So we've got the two of them, they're not connected with each other, but they're there, and they're being bathed by the medium, which is the equivalent of our peritoneal fluid. So there we've got the peritoneal fluid, and we can add the TGF beta to the peritoneal fluid. That makes the mesothelial cells make the lactate, and then what we can do is test the drug. And this produced a really good result, because it showed that the DCA reduced the amount of lactate, and the amount of lactate was reduced, and then the stromal cells didn't divide as much. So we felt this was sort of like a surrogate for potentially we might end up with smaller lesions. But we needed more evidence for the funders before we could go to a full clinical trial, and for this we turned to a mouse model. Now mice don't get endometriosis. Mice don't normally menstruate, and menstruation is one of the primary triggers for endometriosis. But we can do the work in the lab and mimic the process of menstruation in a mouse. We can use this menstruating mouse to answer all kinds of other questions about heavy bleeding and other things. So we produce a mouse which has some menstruating material. We transfer that material into another mouse and this mouse ends up with endometriosis lesions. They look just like the ones in the women. They've got immune cells, nerves, they've got a blood supply. And this is the platform in which we can test the drug by giving it to the mouse one week, um, just orally. And this produced a striking result. On the bottom here, you see the size of the lesions, and I don't need to tell you which is which. The control one is the red, and the one where the mouse has had the DCA is the black. Now, this evidence was sufficient for us to press on to do a clinical trial and to get the funding to do that. And Andrew's going to tell you more about that. So the, <coughs> the EPIC uh, clinical trial is actually a fairly straightforward design. It's what we call uh, a single arm open label uh, study. So the, both the patients and the clinicians knew that they were the, the, the participants in the trials were, were taking the drug. Uh, when I say it was simple, it was complicated by the fact that we started it just the week before the first lockdown. And as you can imagine, the, the impact that's had on recruiting to trials has been uh, tremendous. But we've managed to recruit uh, 30 uh, participants to this study and the participants before they took the, the drug, the dichloroacetate, which they took for 12 weeks, at the start of the study they completed uh, pain scores and they completed quality of life questionnaires. Um, and then at the end of the study they completed the same pain scores and quality of life questionnaires. We also collected uh, blood samples from them uh, during the study to do some pharmacology around the drug. And of course, the, main, the, main, the most important thing about this study was to check that they tolerated it and to check that they didn't get 
uh, terrible side effects that would prohibit them from, from uh, continuing to take it afterwards. We've got some initial uh, results from the study which are, are really exciting, I think. Um, so the first thing is that the pain scores um, from the patients dropped by two points on the 0 to 10 pain score that they were given at the start of the trial. And then the, the questionnaires which we gave them, which uh, measured the, the sort of impact endometriosis has on their quality of life, you can see that we saw a 50% fall from 67 out of 100 to 33 out of 100. But I think the most exciting thing about this study is that two-thirds of the trial participants are reported that they use significantly less pain medication by the end of the study. Now, obviously, we have to uh, treat all of this with caution because it is single arm, it is open label, um, and the next step will be to do a much bigger multi-centre study uh, across the UK, and we're hoping to start that uh, towards the end of this year. Our next uh, project is something that Philip and I are both uh, very excited about, and this is called the ENDO 1000 project. And the idea of this project is that we're going to recruit 1,000 uh, patients or, or, or people with suspected endometriosis, and we're then going to monitor them over a two-year period. And during that two-year period, we'll collect uh, clinical information, they'll put in information about their pain and their symptoms, and we'll also collect a number of samples. And we'll be using some of the techniques and methodologies that, that uh, Philip has talked about in, from some of our other studies. We'll be using smartwatches, we'll be using apps, we'll be looking at the microbiome and the metabolome in samples of urine, samples of feces and blood samples. Um, we'll also be linking the patients to their hospital data, and we haven't had time to talk about projects we're doing with Aberdeen. So these are data linkage projects which allow you to monitor the patients essentially for their, the rest of their lives. And the idea is that information will then be fed into a big, if you like, supercomputer and we'll use machine learning and artificial intelligence to look for, for patterns which could potentially help us better understand endometriosis. So just to summarise that in a different way, if you imagine that we have a data hub, a big sort of supercomputer if you like, we feed in the biological data, so maybe information about the uh, microbiome, we'll feed in genetic information, and then we'll also feed in clinical and patient reported information. So we'll also be wanting to know not just whether they've had surgery or they've taken medical treatments prescribed by doctors, but also if they've done things themselves, changed their lifestyle to try and um, improve their symptoms. And what we want to do with this study is we want to collectively look at the therapeutic space, so all of the sorts of treatments that uh, are given to patients currently with endometriosis, all the sorts of interventions they make themselves. Um, and what we're wanting to be able to do, well, for me as a clinician, is move away from standard practice, which is giving a generalised recommendation based on uh, study and on data from clinical trials, for example, and move much more towards this precision medicine approach. Now, precision medicine's been around for some time, and it's been used very successfully in other conditions, but it's never been applied to a condition like endometriosis. And we hope that by using data-driven disease subtyping and uh, patient stratification, that this will lead to better diagnostics and better management for uh, patients with endometriosis. So I'd like to uh, finish on what I hope is a positive note about the way uh, forward with our research. Um, and I'd just like to say that um, Philip and I have been recognised by this uh, prize, which is fantastic, but this is a real team effort, and this is our team uh, all dressed in yellow for Endometriosis Action Month just a, a couple of weeks ago. Um, and the other people that we have to recognise, of course, are the support that we get from uh, patient support groups and patient organisations. So thank you very much uh, for listening, um, and Philip and I would be very happy to uh, take some questions. presentation and congratulations on your award. This is now the fun bit where you all get to ask your questions. For two years we have been doing this online and the advantage 
of doing a Q&A session online is that we can read the questions before we ask them. So Philippa and Andrew have reassured me that they are happy to answer absolutely anything. There are no silly questions. So please do raise your hands nice and clearly so that I can see you. Heather and Kevin have microphones. The microphones are already switched on. So when they hand them to you, you don't need to try and switch them on. Now, there are lots of people who would have loved to have been here this evening, but couldn't make it. So we are recording this session, and that means that we will have evidence if somebody asks a question that then sparks another research study. So no pressure. Last event was 2019, and you've just told us about the work that you're doing now because you did a science festival event. So that is really, really exciting for us to hear. And another you know, reason that you've received this award today. So thank you. Um, so if anyone is feeling brave and would like to go first. Oh, there we go, right next to you, Heather. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was absolutely fascinating and well done and well deserved on the award. I'm glad that no question is a silly question because I'm not. Sci my background is not science, so here goes. Um, but I'm wondering the relationship between research like this and the GPs on the front line, because for a lot of us, that's our, th these are our gatekeepers. And certainly the, the way we describe symptoms, the, the way we describe the pain is, is really quite difficult. And obviously for a lot of GPs, with this new research coming through, that's that for, for many people is the challenging point, the challenging point in the relationship. So I'm wondering how you as a researchers have those conversations with, with the GPs. We've even got a GP in the audience, yeah. but. <laughs> <laughs> so so we, we do work uh, very closely with GPs, because as you say, they're, they're the first interface. And um, we worked with the Royal College of General Practitioners to produce a, a package which we hope is helpful for GPs in terms of communicating and discussing the condition. But I, think, I think in terms of research, um, that, that's a, probably a, something that we don't do very well. Um, we maybe don't do so much multidisciplinary research that reaches into primary care. Um, so it's definitely something that we should uh, think about more, more closely um, in future studies. I mean, it is, um, we had a, a research day at Warwick University um, late last year and I was really, really interested in the presentation from a GP about the challenges that she was facing. Um, and what she said was, you know, it, it, one of the real problems is we've emphasised, probably not enough, how very complicated it is in terms of symptom presentation. And, and this is what's holding things back. So the other thing that's happening is there's a huge amount of effort going into diagnostics, which we haven't talked about, but we are working with groups around the world and huge numbers of patient samples to try and maybe get better genetic signatures, better ways of helping the GPs triage people, because it must be very difficult um, to, you know, when you're presented with someone who might be having bowel symptoms or got pain or they're worried about infertility, to really know what it might be what it might be. And the other thing we were talking to colleagues, we're in a quite a few EU projects. It's very interesting how different countries manage these things. And, and colleagues in uh, Denmark were saying that any young woman who, who went um, just to primary care with any kind of pain would just immediately put, be put on a contraceptive pill when they were quite young. And that, that might also help them. Of course, the thing is, none of this is a cure, really. It's, it's interesting, in, in Denmark, um, they actually have, everybody has an app and they can connect directly to their own records. They can email their GP through the app. It's, it's incredible. It's hopefully something that we'll see you know, in the NHS. Very yeah, interesting. It's interesting. Yeah. But, but yeah, it, it, it's, it's a huge challenge. Just to say, when we're talking about that PSP, there were GPs on that PSP as well, and that was very helpful in framing questions. So it's just a question of just keeping at it all the time, I think. Andrew, on that note, we know something from your earlier research is that a woman may go to her GP many, many times, um, reporting pain, reporting different symptoms. What are the things that help get the diagnosis? What are the things that people need to be prepared and take with them to be listened to? Do you have any advice about that? 
Um, so I think it's, it's often helpful that there's, there's symptom diaries that people can complete. And I think that's helpful then to <coughs> be able to go to your GP and say, you know, there's a pattern to this. Maybe it's happening every day or maybe it's happening at a certain time in, you, in the cycle. We talk about red flag, flag symptoms and this cyclicity of symptoms is something that a GP or a clinician would uh, pick up on. But I think you've got to remember, I mean, GPs don't have very long to see you. So if you can produce, you know, something like that. I think if you do think you have endometriosis, you can go to some of the sites, maybe speak to some of the groups um, and bring information with you um, as well. But um, it, can, it can sometimes be challenging, I think. Those groups, they're so important in your research, aren't they? They're supporting your research financially, mm. but they're contributing to the research itself as well, yeah. aren't they? Yeah, it's very much a two-way process. Two -way process. Um, would anyone else like to ask a question? Yep, okay, so we've got three. So we'll start here with the lady in the white top. Thank you. Hi there. Um, just to repeat what <laughs> the previous person said, uh, no science history or anything like that. Um, I'm just curious into what your input would be on potentially COVID and the COVID vaccine having an impact on endometriosis symptoms. Um, I feel like myself, I'm someone with suspected endometriosis and I have found that the vaccines have kind of played a part on my symptoms changing. Um, so what your input is on that? So, so we, we're not specifically running any research looking at COVID or, or the vaccine on endometriosis, but we have a, a colleague who works with us, Jackie Maben, who's actually got a, a grant looking at the impact of both of these things on all, all different types of menstrual symptoms, including just the normal menstrual cycle. So um, I can always give you her contact so you can have a look at her work. And I think Jackie is looking for participants, isn't she? She is, yeah. She's yeah, looking she for is, more yeah. women to sign up yeah. to her study. Oh, yeah. Great. So. Lovely. And then at the back, Kevin, um, yep, there we go. Thank you. Yeah, um, sorry, it's just touching back on the genetic markers that you were speaking about earlier. Um, obviously, genetic sequencing isn't a very common thing to happen in the UK. Do, are you aware of any projects that are looking at an actual blood biomarker so that it could be a little bit easier for GPs to potentially diagnose endometriosis? And to kind of further to the question with GPs, is there any efforts going into actually teaching them more about endometriosis to end the medical gaslighting that we experience as patients? Because personally, and I know that a lot of other women in the room are the same um, that have the condition, it took me 14 years to get to my diagnosis after presenting multiple times with symptoms to be constantly turned away by my GP saying it's just a bad period. So, shall I just talk about the biomarkers, then I'll hand over to Andrew just to talk about the work that is going on in, from the Royal Colleges in terms of education. So, so the, the holy grail of a biomarker would be a blood test that gave us really good um, fidelity and a, a really good prediction. So there's been a number of different ways that this has been approached, um, and I think we are getting to the point where we're really making some progress here. We've been partnering with um, a large pharmaceutical company who've put a lot of work into this and they've been using samples from our patients and other patients and they tell us they think they have a, a test that they're going to be able to um, test soon. So that's based on proteins in the blood. An alternative um, endpoint that's been patented actually by people in the USA is to look for small fragments of DNA. These are called microRNAs. Um, colleagues in, in America believe that they have found a pattern that they think is predictive. We are waiting to see whether that will be replicated in other, in other centres. And the reason for caution is because we've been trying to find good biomarkers and everybody has a, bio they have a biomarker and then we try to replicate it and it doesn't quite come through, which is disappointing. And then the final area where we've been participating has been in looking at DNA um, modifications either in the endometrium or maybe we could pick them up in the circulation, which will give a genetic signature which might predict um, a higher likelihood of having endometriosis. With the genetic work, one of the big benefits has been it's also thrown up linkages to other conditions, and this includes things like migraine, 
asthma and other conditions where then it helps us with that drug repurposing. So I don't want you to get the impression that nothing's going on, there's a lot going on, but I haven't got my biomarker in the lab to put in the clinic just yet. But I'm really optimistic it's not going to be that much longer and that really will help the GPs. And I'll turn to Andrew about the education. Yeah. Um, so, so in terms of education, I mean, in broader terms, we obviously work with Endometriosis UK, Endo Warriors, other groups, just to raise awareness generally, because I think awareness is, is still too low um, across the board, not just perhaps amongst uh, GPs. Um, as I say, we have worked with the Royal College to produce uh, an education package for GPs. Um, the, the guidance that we renew, so we've got the NICE guidance, which should be renewed, has a kind of simple, if you like, diagram that GPs can follow a pathway. We've just renewed the European guideline as well. And with all of these guidelines, um, we try and publicize them as widely as possible just to raise awareness amongst um, any, every clinician. Um, but I'm sorry you've had such a, a difficult time, but I think, I think it's just all about talking about it as much as possible so that um, the awareness is there for, for everybody. It's one of the reasons we do these events, isn't yeah. it? We really want to make it easier for people to talk about when things are difficult so that other people know it's not normal or what's normal. So we're, we're on a mission, aren't we? We're really trying to have more of these conversations. Okay, at the front of the room here, Heather, thank you. What are you most excited about as being a sort of potential route for improving quality of life for women with endometriosis? So, of all your research projects, which are you most excited about in terms of improving quality of life? Um, reducing I'm, I'm that pain? personally completely into this diet one, and I tell you why. Because there's um, other fields where we can clearly see that the microbiome is having an impact on the bra on the brain axis. And um, as I, I mentioned very briefly, there was a, you know, I, I'm one of those people who's always looking for another paper that might be relevant from another field. And last year, there was a really lovely paper published from a big group in America where they'd taken um, individuals and put them onto new diets for 12 weeks. They put them onto either a high fiber diet or a fermented food diet. Um, I mean, I thought the fermented food diet would be lots of kimchi and stuff, which, you know, wasn't immediately appealing, but it turned out to be sort of biological yogurts and, you know, the kind of yakult that I would have every day. Now, the thing about that was they weren't looking particularly at pain, but what they looked at was inflammatory markers using a really big battery of jolly good tests, and they found a massive difference with the people who'd had the fermented foods. So that was only 12 weeks, and it made a real difference. So I think what we need to do is get more of this evidence and come up with a bit of a plan. Because what bothers me is, um, and, and, and I, get, I get this from my daughter who's a dietitian. she says if people are eliminating loads and loads of nutrients from their diet, they're not actually going to be as healthy and they should all be taking vitamins, you know, and uh, we shouldn't all um, it, do these diets where you don't eat anything. So I think wanting, um, I, I'm excited about the diet one actually. Yeah. I think uh, Philip and I are often get into trouble about being excited about too many projects. But, <laughs> All the time. Um, I'm very excited about the, the dichloroacetate project because we've seen that through from our PhD student uh, Vicky over a number of years and, and there just isn't a non-hormonal option available for people at the moment. Um, but I, th I think probably at the moment Endo 1000 is very exciting because that, that, that cohort of, of patients once we generate and information can be used for lots and lots of different projects, you know, collaborations with people across the UK, beyond the UK as well. So I think that probably is the, the way forward for us. Philippa, you mentioned you have 15 people on that diet study just now. Is that no, right? I've got 15 people on the tech study. On the tech study. The tech study's going great guns. I mean, the great, the, I must say one of the best things about being at the University of Edinburgh, and I have to say this because Jonathan's here in the room, obviously, <laughs> um, is we are really blessed with people who've got such a multitude of talent. You know, I met Tenasis because we were on a, a PhD program supervisory board and we got chatting about his work. And I was just amazed what he could do with the kind of data analysis. And then when we hire a PhD student who's on a maths background, I mean, it's quite challenging for us, but it's fantastic because it means you are actually going to make progress. So it's bringing together all the talents. And this is what endometriosis needs, is it needs to be 
um, stepping outside of the comfort zone of us looking just what we do as reproductive people. We've got to link up with other, other studies. And the genetic studies have been particularly useful for that, making us think much more laterally. And this is what's going to make the difference. And these cohort studies have been amazing in other fields, and no one's done it in endometriosis. So we've just got to, haven't we? We're going to do it. Can, can people take part? If they want to, if they want to take part in the tech study or the diet yeah, study, yeah. can we they? Will, uh, we've got a website. We'll be definitely recruiting people. We've got all our wonderful, we've got our wonderful nurses here in the audience, and they they're always happy to speak to people. There you are. They're waving at us at the back <laughs> there. Here we go. Um, would anyone else like to ask a question? We have plenty of time. Great, Kevin at the back there. Thank you. Do you think that the incidence of endometriosis? is increasing or is that a reflection of the fact that people are slowly becoming more aware and more interested or could you speculate about any other factors that might be contributing to a perceived increase so is there an increase or is there something else going on i, I think it's it, it's very difficult to tell i think i think it probably is people speaking up and people realizing when something's not right and maybe you know having the courage to go and speak to their, their GP or go to a doctor about very severe pain because of course pain's invisible it's very subjective um, and as we've heard it's often difficult to be get, get listened to so I think I think there's there's that um, I, I I don't know maybe I mean obviously our diet has changed a lot and that's something as you you've heard we're very interested in maybe that's having an impact um, but I think we haven't, um, even now, the estimates of the, inc of the incidents are, are estimates. We haven't had a very good means of collecting information. We don't have a, a registry of patients with endometriosis. So that, again, is something that I think would, would help move the field forward. I and don't know if you have... Yeah. No, I was just going to say, and it's hugely underdiagnosed in outside of first world countries. So, you know, most of the research has been done, has been done in um, North America, Australia, the UK and, uh, and Europe. Um, there's um, huge amounts of endometriosis, clearly in countries within Africa, but it's very rarely recognised. There's also social taboos that make it very difficult for some groups of women to talk about having a reproductive disorder. Um, so I think it's much, much more prevalent than we know. Um, and also, the diagnosis being for the superficial disease being based on surgery, um, we, we a number of years ago were getting um, donated samples from individuals who were just having um, a tubal ligation for a, um, to stop their fertility, and we found endometriosis lesions in individuals who'd never reported having any symptoms. So it's this difficulty of there being lesions in individuals who maybe never reported a symptom because they thought it was normal, or maybe they didn't have a symptom. And then there's really, really strange data showing that the amount, you know, amount of these superficial lesions doesn't correlate very much with how much pain you have. And that may be because we're just not diagnosing it properly. But the answer to your question is, I think it's far more prevalent than we know. And actually, there's huge parts of the world and social groups who are not being served at all. And that, that is something we should all be much more aware of. Okay. I think we have time for one or two more questions. So if there's anything anybody would like to ask, now is your chance. Yep. Uh, so we've got gentlemen at the back there, Heather, and then we'll come to you for the last question. Thank you. Hi. Uh, could you talk a bit more about the, the links between the priorities that were identified in the, the PSP and the, the three research projects that, you're, that you talked about afterwards. I wasn't clear what the, whether there was a clear link between those, those top ten priorities and the projects that, that you spoke about later. So um, the, if I could take the, the trial one first, it was to look for alternative uh, ways of managing endometriosis which weren't you know, the standard uh, hormonal management um, and surgical management. Um, if we look at the other studies, there was one, one of the research questions was, again, around lifestyle, that, that self-management. Sort of self -management. 
Um, and then I suppose the, um, the endotech one is much more to do with um, impact um, of endometriosis. So I didn't show you the list of the research questions. Um, we, we have also kept looking at the sort of 30, haven't we, as well, because some of the ones that dropped out, again, you know, if they were the 11th or the 12th on the list, we think were also very important. But um, the, the, ma the main questions were around diagnosis and around alternative treatments. Um, and obviously, ultimately, a, a cure as well or a prevention for, for endometriosis. Thank you. Sorry, just thought another one with the end of 1000 in <laughs> project. Is there a rough timeline for when that will be expected to start with recruitment and when eventually um, publications and things like that will be expected to be seen? So we're currently um, fundraising for the project. We're working with the philanthropy team here. Um, so it slightly depends on, on our, when, we, when we get the funding to, to make a start with it. We're hoping to have the fundraising complete within a year. That's our target. And then to get it all up and running, probably take another four to six months before we can start recruiting. But as soon as, as, soon as we do that, then we'll get it off the ground. Thank you very much. There were no difficult questions there. And nothing Great questions. Answer. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks to everyone for their interest and support. We appreciate it. Yeah, and Andrew and Philippa, thank you both so much. You hugely deserve this award for the support you give other people and for the leadership you've both shown in this area. So I'd like to invite Professor Seckel back to the stage to give it to you now. Wow, what a fantastic event. What brilliant talks. And all of it put together in the light of what Patients, the public, think is important. It's actually quite different from what scientists, doctors, academics think is important. And yet it's quite clear that focusing research and innovation on what matters to the sufferers, their families, and the general public is considerably more important. It's incredibly enlightening to my colleagues and to myself. So actually to listen to colleagues who focus their research away from abstruse technical questions that amuse us academics into the things that matter to the patients and the public is very energizing. It's a really fantastic example of doing what's important rather than what just happens to be of passing academic interest. So that was a brilliant example of it. And I'm extraordinarily grateful to Philippa and Andrew for their leadership and their prescience in turning their brilliant science to something that really matters. I've been a doctor in between being a rather grey and boring university leader. I've been a doctor for more than 40 years. I remember learning about endometriosis as a spotty medical student a millennium ago. And it always struck me as an area where we knew nothing and we sort of ignored the patients and their terrible suffering because we couldn't understand it. And now for the first time I hear of vision, understanding, and substantial progress. So thank you, colleagues. I think I'm going to buy shares in dichloroacetate, though I suspect it's a very simple molecule you can buy, not going to make any money out of that. buy over the counter. <laughs> so we're not going to dash out and do that. And as for fermented food, it sounded very unpleasant until it turned into yogurt. But yoghurt, uh, yoghurt, I think, we can probably, many of us, manage with. Although, for those who are lactose, lacking, lactose, intol lactose intolerant, and lactase lacking, it will be a bit of a challenge. We'll have to find something else. It's like kimchi stuff, you know. Kimchi stuff. There we go. Well, we've had a real tour de force this evening, ladies and gentlemen. And it now remains for me to hand over the prizes. And they are about to be awarded. So the first one is for Philippa. 
Many congratulations. Thank you. Oh, beautiful. I feel like I've won Master Chef or something. This is really nice. <laughs> and the second is for Andrew. Super. Engagement indeed. That's Fantastic. Well, that I think leaves us simply to say thank you again to our brilliant prize winners. Thanks again to the DL family, to Tam up there somewhere for his brilliant sponsorship of outreach and engagement in science and to thank the audience for your patience and for attending. There are a little bit of refreshments, I'm told, somewhere nearby. I hope somebody will... Yes, they're just behind you. So don't dash away. Interact, talk to my colleagues, to myself, and enjoy the refreshments. But the formal part of today is over. Thank you for coming on a Sunday evening. Thank you.